uh, spiritual men, but as to worldly, even as to babes in Christ. And other versions say infants in Christ, which is a good image. I have fed you with milk and not with solid food, for to this day you are not able to endure it, nor are you able now. For you are still worldly, since there is envy, strife, and divisions amongst you, among you. And you are not worldly, or are you not worldly in behaving as mere men? For while one says, I am, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not worldly? So jumping back to verse 1 and 2 there for a second, uh, what does Paul mean when, when he's speaking that he can't speak to them as spiritual men but as babes? Is he saying, you know, sorry, I, I probably went too fast for you. Um, you guys just aren't ready and it my fault. No, no, he's not saying that at all. He, he was telling them that he was very disappointed that they weren't ready, that they hadn't grown. And that they were exactly in a spot when he had left them before. Uh, he had spent about a, a year and a half with them, as far as records tell us. So they were exactly where they were when he left. After spending a year and a half with them, they, they really hadn't grown on their own. And the message version of, of uh, this really, really, I think, brings uh, life to Paul's position. He said, you were, are you still worldly since there's envy and strife? That's the same one, isn't it? Yep, there we go. But right now, friends, I am completely frustrated by your unspiritual dealings with each other and with God. You're acting like infants in relation to Christ, capable of nothing much more than nursing at the breast. He was frustrated that they weren't maturing as believers. They were not able to understand any advanced teaching whatsoever. And they weren't able to help new believers either. Looking at uh, verses 3 and 4, Paul's directing them to their own behavior, that they're trying to one-up each other. You know, I, I'm actually from, I'm of Paul, which must be higher than Apollos. I don't, I don't know uh, if that's what their thinking was. But they were literally trying to, to, to take uh, their value from who they had been taught by instead of learning from and, and teaching and growing each other. So what all did this include? Well, mostly we'll find it, that, but the separation, the lack of separation between the, the, the church and what was going around outside of the church in, in the world, in the, uh, the area that they were living and they were allowing the unrepentant, the so-called believers, into the church as church members, as family, and perhaps even into the ministry when they really hadn't changed anything except the label. Um, for for my Republican friends, um, I would like to call that um, a Chino, a Christian in name only, like the rhinos. If you've ever heard of that reference, um, they they literally just taken the name and they hadn't changed anything. They were they were just like they were before they walked into the church. Just now that they were calling themselves a church member. So going on to verse five, who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to each one. I have planted Apollos water but God gave the increase. So then neither is he who plants nor he who waters anything. But God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one. And each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. You are God's vineyard. You are God's building. This is one of my favorite passages. Uh, I'm, I've told you before, I am not a farmer. Um, I have worked on a farm, but that does not make me a farmer. Like standing in a garage does not make you a mechanic. Uh, 
I'm not a farmer, but I love this illustration because it reminds me that at times I forget, maybe we all forget that we're all working for the same master. Um, I strive to cheer for my brothers and sisters who have giftings that I don't. To remember that we are all on the same team and that a win for you is a win for me. And a win for me is a win for you because they're all wins for Christ. And all Christ's wins are for God. I heard somebody put it simpler and it went something like this. If, if, if you feel defeated when someone you witness to, someone you share the gospel with, doesn't get saved, pray to Jesus uh, and ask him to be the, their personal savior. If you feel defeated by that, you need to be very careful. Because when you, when you do share with someone and they get saved and they pray and ask Jesus to be their personal savior, you might take the credit for it. If you feel defeated because they didn't get saved, you need to be careful because you might take credit if, they, if those that you pray, or pray with and share with do get saved. And that, that's not your place. That's not your credit. That's not your job. That's, that's not within the authority that God has given us. We are called to plant, to water, but the Lord is the one who makes it grow. Amen? Jesus said in John chapter 6, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up in the last day. Jesus told this to a crowd after he had fed the 5,000 plus people with a kid's New Testament age lunchable. The kid had two fish and, and, and five loaves of bread and it, they broke it all up and, and fed 5,000 plus people. And he told them because he told them this because they were murmuring or complaining that Jesus had just told them that he was the bread of life. So to, to keep that in context, let's, let's expand that a little bit. So Jesus, therefore, answered them, Do not murmur amongst yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who has sent me draws him, and I will raise him up in the last day. It is written in the prophets, They shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and has learned of the Father comes to me. And this is John uh, chapter 6 is one of the most notable times that Jesus let people walk away. Thousands walked away because the teaching of the truth was too hard. They couldn't accept it. They wouldn't accept it. They were uncomfortable and they walked away. And if you, I encourage you to, to read that if you haven't read that in a while. But the interesting part is Jesus didn't chase after them. He loved them enough to share the truth with them. But he did not chase after them when they wouldn't receive it. He didn't give them a second chance or a better offer. He loved them enough to present the truth. And they chose not to accept it. We all play a part, if you will in God's plan to preach the gospel to the whole world. You and I, and everyone God calls, but make sure that you understand what's not your assignment. We all have the Holy Spirit living inside of us, and, and getting a little bit ahead of the text for chapter 3 here, but, but it fits really well here. You have the gift of the Holy Spirit. Because of that gift, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you, Philippians 4.13. But you are not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. You cannot do what only he can do. And you and I are his servants. And even his children, his sons and daughters. But church, there are things that only the Father can do. Forgive people of their sins. Add names to the Lamb's book of life. 
If we get caught up in thinking that we can do what only God can do, then we're deceiving ourselves. And worse, we will be disheartened and eventually it will separate our hearts from God. Because let's face it, if you can do all of these things, you don't need a Savior. You don't need God because you are now God. And we all know that that's simply not true. I share this because we need to not expect things from others or ourselves that we simply aren't called to. If we do, we will never be satisfied with their performance or ours. Because we are expecting something that God didn't ask from us or equipped us for. And the main point of this is the division. Paul is explaining that all of this is part, a part in including God. All of this, all of us have a part. And if our expectations are skewed, we will always have division. And the opposite of division is unity. And that's Paul's whole point. He says in verse 8, Uh, go, looking back at verse 8, he says, Now he who plants and he who waters are one. And they and we are one with each other and one with Christ. Amen? Amen. Going on to verse 10. According to the grace of God, which has been given to me as a wise, wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, but also... But, but another builds on it. Now let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no one, no one can lay another foundation than that which was laid. Now this, is, this was Paul's point at the beginning of the chapter and, and the reason why he opened it the way that he did. Uh, in, not in the message version, but in the, in the SEV which is not an official version, but that's uh, S-I-V, the, the stew-inspired version, it would probably say, uh, you boneheads are not following the things that I taught you. It is, it is not anything like what I said. And that is not an official, it's not, it's, it's not in print yet. Uh, but Paul had taught them holy living, righteousness, purity, Repent of the worldly practices you've been in or, or around. For this is the foundation that Jesus Christ laid down for us. Set us apart for his glory and for his usefulness. You must not live like the world lives. Why? It's foundational. And I'm pretty sure I just made that word up. But it, it is. It's part. It's got to be part of the foundation. It's so true, and that's what Paul was getting at. As believers, you must start with the basics. The foundation is living right. And Paul tells us that in Philippians 4, verse 8, Finally, brothers, whatever, whatever things are true, whatever things are honest, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, and if there's any praise, think on these things. This is what the believers, the church foundation, and the foundation of Jesus Christ laid down. We are to build our lives, our church, on the foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ for the builder, because it doesn't belong to us. It's, I say it. I've heard you say it. I don't know that it's wrong, but it can affect the way that we feel about things. Our church, my church. Not that it's wrong, but it can lead to wrong thinking. Because you know what? When you forget who it belongs to and who you're doing work for, it can affect your heart. So the foundation, which is Jesus Christ, 
the end of verse 11 there. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or stubble, each one's work will be revealed. For the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test what sort of work each has done. If anyone's work, which he has built on the foundation, endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, still going through the fire. As I studied this week, I was sharing with uh, Dennis before the service. I, I was so pleased that... Uh, when I do go to my commentaries, go to uh, the footnotes in the, in my Bible, it's it's I'm always blessed when uh, when I read that the commentaries agree with me, and not because not because of me, but but seriously, it, when I read that that they've come to the same conclusions and opinions on on what God is teaching us. It reinforces in my spirit that God is revealing that to me. And and he did. And he did to Paul as Paul was writing these down. So so Paul is describing the building of the foundation with on that foundation with different materials. With gold, silver, precious stone, hay, wood, stubble. Why? Why these types of materials? Well, these types are representative of things in our lives, in our church's atmosphere or culture. It's simply our attitude, our behavior, or character, or our resolve. Holy, righteous, and godly values are represented by the gold, silver, and precious stone. The old self, the worldly values and traits, are represented by the wood, hay, or stubble. And it's pretty easy to see that when tested by fire, some are going to be strengthened and some are going to prove that's quite temporary because they're going to be consumed. The fire will test that. The fire of life, life's trials or struggles, challenges, will aid us in removing these temporary worldly traits that simply need to go. And I'm not sure when that process ever ends here on earth because I think there's still a little bit that needs to be chiseled away, that needs to be ran through the fire one more time. I don't know how that got stuck to the precious stone, but it must have, and it needs to be burned off. Only what will make it through the fire is what we need to have. Verse 16. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy it. For the temple of God is holy and you are his temple. Let no one deceive himself. Let's read that verse 16 again. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Well, I like the amplified version of this one really, really hits it and brings it to home. Do you not know and understand that you, the church, are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells permanently in you, collectively and individually. I've noticed so many have thought Paul was teaching about how we should take care of our bodies because they're the temple of God. Since the Holy Spirit lives in us, and that's true. But in this context, the word that he used here for you is plural. He was talking about the body of Christ as the temple. And those who tear it down are subject to God destroying them. Yes, 
It applies to us as individuals as well. But, but here Paul is addressing the, this division inside the church of Corinth. The church of Jesus Christ as a whole. And yes, even New York Mills Assembly of God. Take note that this church is his bride. And he is a righteous husband who will defend his bride. If anyone is bringing division, he will destroy those who tear her down. Husbands, take note. This is how a righteous man treats his bride. He will defend her. And God will defend his church. Picking back up the believe that's the end of 18. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written in, in Job, he catches the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the righteous thoughts of the wise that they are vain. Therefore, let no one boast in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cyphus, which is Peter, or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours, and you are Christ's, and Christ is God's. Paul lays it out pretty plainly for us that we must mature. In Christ. We must be fruitful in our growth in him, in his service. We must be about building his temple. And that's both uh, individually as well as collectively. His temple with righteous, godly building materials that will stand the test of fire. And yes, I am being encouraging because in case you didn't in case you, you didn't recognize that, that was an encouraging statement, I'm I am being positive here. I am positive that you will walk through fire. The, the fires of struggle, the fires of disappointment, the fires of testing, and even the plain old fires of life. But if we are maturing in the word. And if we are producing the fruits of unity, of one team for Jesus, his temple will be built, his kingdom expanded, and we will be, and our church, his church, will be filled with the glory of God. Amen? So, I added this last night as I read through this one more time. God really laid this on my heart. Let not your heart be troubled, no matter where you are on the road to God's kingdom. Whether you've just begun, you've been traveling for years, or if you aren't sure that you've even started that journey. None of us are perfect here. And this really touched me when, when I think it was uh, Mike that had said it this, uh, before when we were praying about being vulnerable here. Because none of us are perfect here. We are all in process. All of us are in process. But we are following Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And I encourage you, I want to encourage you, if you want support, someone to, that you can ask and learn from, don't hesitate and don't wait for someone to approach you. Be bold and ask. Because we have not because we ask not. There's going to be a day, we were just talking about this morning at the end, end of, of Daniel, there's going to be a day that God has already set when it's going to be too late. None of us want a family member to be 
too late. None of us want a child or a parent or an ornery neighbor. We don't want any of them to be too late. So we need to mature in Christ. We need to continue that process of becoming more like him and getting rid of more of the old me. Continue to chisel that away. That comes through the word, spending time in his word, spending time with others in fellowship, spending time studying the word of God together, time in prayer, all of those things. And all of those things will help you prepare for the fires that you're going to walk through. Because you can you can be as positive thinking as you like, and you're still going to have a fire to walk through. We need to prepare for that, and we can. God's given us a real good template right here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. So I encourage you, continue. And if you aren't sure that you've started, start. Because today is the day that the Lord has made. And we should rejoice and be glad in it. And I can't think of a better way to rejoice than to know, even though our sins are many, his mercy is more. Amen. Will you pray with me? Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Father, for your word of encouragement. I pray, Father, that you would help us to grasp a hold of this, that we would become more mature in you, understanding and, and, and being able to hear and respond to your voice. We thank you, Father God, for where you've placed us, who you've put around us, and Father, I pray that those fruits would begin to come, that we would see that we all are workers, laborers for the same master, our wonderful, mighty, and gracious creator, our loving God, our heavenly Father. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. May God bless you.